Hello everybody, it's Adam Hurt, 973 Ramp again, and this is the second video in the series we're doing on our 2011 elevator. And this video is going to focus mainly on the power transmission and the cable rigging. So, uh, in the comments for this video, I'll post a picture that shows what cascade rigging is, but also in the comments to the video I did on gearing an elevator, I put that picture as well. But essentially, cascade rigging means you power I'm going to call this black stage. So we have the fixed stage, which is orange. The black stage, which I call the second stage. Why do I call it second? I don't know. Second feels right. Second's what's written all our CAD and stuff. We're going to call it second. And then I call this the carriage. Also, not really sure why I called that the carriage, but that's just kind of pseudo standard convention that we use. So in a cascade system, um, the second stage is driven off of the first stage, and the power transmission for the second actually does not touch the carriage at all. So you essentially have a single stage elevator. Separately from what that, from that, you then hook a loop all the way around, and I'll show where those terminated and why, hooking the carriage to the second stage. And what happens is as you raise the second stage, it pulls cable on one side, and that causes the carriage to pull up. Uh, so by powering just one stage, you get both. Uh, some of the advantages of this is your load is constant because both stages move at the same time. Um, Although SOLIDWORKS does not show that well, this used to be made such that it did show that, such that when, because the way it's shown now is actually an impossible configuration, both elevators, both stages would move together. So if the, if this stage came up an inch from the first, then this would come up an inch from that for a total travel of two inches, which is uh, one of the cons of the cascade is that for your given drum, you actually need twice as much reduction because you get a two to one speed up here. Uh, so we're going to look at this cable rigging. So this plate right here is how we modeled clamping the cable. So pretend right now it's just the upper cable. This lower part of the cable doesn't exist. So you have a cable coming up, looping around this pulley. And although it's not modeled, it is clamped right there. So cable below that doesn't count. How about that? So you can see that now there's a fixed length of cable from here to here. And what happens, and this is some height, as this second stage comes up, this height gets bigger, right? But since we have a fixed le length of cable, that means that cable's got to go somewhere, so this guy comes up. Now, we then do the inverse effect by carrying the cable out to the bottom and up attached to link to the bottom of the carriage. And you need to do that for any reasonably fast elevator so that, uh, like, if you go up quickly and then stop, your elevator doesn't keep coming and then bounce back down, which would slack the cable, cause you to derail, cause problems, and that sort of thing. And then also, uh, if you were to tip or anything, you'd lose the ability to retract your elevator. So I feel that you should do it both ways. And that's kind of convenient because where we clamp it, we just continue the cable down, route under a pulley there, and come up. We did an inline spring, uh, which isn't modeled, but went to this block, which then had a bolt coming down to it. So that was a way to tension that bottom cable. Uh, because otherwise, you have to tie this to the exact perfect length, and that's obviously difficult. So I know I'm not very clearly saying what a cascade is there, but I, th I think I got that concept, plus the picture that I'll post in the comments covers that. So uh, one of the biggest advantages of the cascade, aside from the even loading, is when this is halfway up, then therefore the carriage will be halfway up. And there's a really cool effect to that. So let's say, or I guess first let's cheat, and let's say we get in this impossible configuration here where the carriage is halfway up the second stage, even though the second stage is all the way up. And this is a configuration you could get in with a continuous elevator, whether it's here or if the second stage is all the way down and the carriage is only halfway up the robot. And what this is, is you have these long unsupported beams and it's fairly easy, well, easy isn't the right word, it's possible with a certain amount of force to deflect these tubes and pop your carriage out. So that's bad, obviously. Now this guy didn't have that problem, and one of the reasons, and there's no guarantee you will have that problem. That's a depends on how much force you have and how long your bearings come over and that sort of stuff. So when this actually was back and it's uh, halfway up in its possible configuration, you get a really cool effect. In that, well, let's pretend that's exactly centered. Your carriage is centered in your second stage when your second stage is centered in your frame. So you have these bearings, which are indirectly hooked up to this tension member, essentially, keeping your frame from spreading apart and popping out. So that means your true worst case, actually, for a cascade elevator would be something 
this could be kind of a mind screw for me. Something like that, probably, where you're actually about halfway or a quarter of the way up, or maybe about a third of the way up. And obviously, this is going to be much harder to deflect and pop out than if you were in the middle, completely unsupported. So I think that's a pretty cool effect that's really subtle. Uh, I know a lot of teams do continuous elevators. I feel that for a team doing their first elevator, a single stage, where you don't even have the carriage, you're just driving the black one up and down, or a cascade two stage is the way to go. Continuous elevators are more tedious. I'm not saying one is better than the other. Obviously, I feel the cascade is better because we did it, but I understand people have different requirements and different, uh, they weight things differently uh, in terms of importance to them. So, like, I viewed having a, uh, an even load to make controls easier more important than maybe some other teams did. Uh, another cool advantage of the Cascade, if you do it right, is if you decouple this plate and pull these bearing blocks, not bearing blocks out, these bearing bolts out, which is four bolts and a nut, our entire elevator comes out, which is really cool to me. Oh, I'm sorry, you also have to remove this bearing. Entire elevator comes out, you could put a whole new spare in with the carriage already assembled in the second, already cabled, slide it down, assemble that bearing back in, put these four bearings back in, put your clamp blade on, boom, you have a new elevator in there, good to go. Well, with the rack and pinion, because you can slide into the rack and pinion, which leads into the rack and pinion. So, this right here actually is a nine-tooth gear, it's modeled as a circle, and then this, not shown very well, is a, oh, this is actually 16 dp, so that uh, those calculations I posted in the previous video are wrong, and I will change those. I won't repost the video, probably not, but you guys can change that yourself. So that diameter actually would have been 9 divided by 16 instead of 9 divided by 12. And I really should remember that. So this is the rack we water jetted out. I wouldn't really recommend doing a rack and pinion elevator without the ability to water jet or lazing gears with uh, with kind of excess amount. Because if you use all your water jetting to make this, I think that's dumb. You should be using your water jetting and laser cutting, if you have it, to make more important things than this, because you could easily make an elevator, elevator without the rack and pinion. I thought it was pretty cool for this, and that's why we did it. Uh, we, we actually thought it was so cool that halfway through the design, we switched to it, and that's why we have some of the odd spacing here, and that's why we have these like cheater plates there. So that rack essentially is just riveted directly to the second stage, and we have a small single stage gearbox. This is modeled as a plastic gear, it actually was aluminum though. Um, this shaft was a little tricky to make, but we did make this in-house by a student as well. He's now a mentor, but he was a student then. Uh, don't want to criticize the other mentors, but when this kid was a student, he was a better machinist than all of our mentors are now, except him, obviously. So he knew what he was doing. So uh, things I would do differently here. We had a little trouble with that gear being 9-tooth. Nine 9-tooth nine is just kind of crazy undercut. I would probably make that 12 tooth now and then do a little more reduction here. Kind of switch to bag motors, which kind of, with that RPM difference, puts you back in the range you want with that less reduction there. If this were a single stage elevator, no carriage, you don't get that 2 to 1 cascade effect, so you could do much less reduction here, and that actually makes this a cleaner option, I think. Uh, and less reduction, actually, I would, instead of making this reduction less, I would increase the diameter here to make that stronger and make it to where you don't have to use these little itty bitty bearings. These bearings are awesome. I love them. Uh, I shouldn't really advocate these because these are real small. I'll just point out how cool these are. These are a 5 16 OD, half inch, I'm sorry, ID, half inch OD, and they're very thin. 156 thou. Uh, they come from RC cars. Kind of hit or miss how cheap you can get them, though. We used to be able to get them for about a buck a piece, and now we paid a couple dollars each year this year to do them. So yeah, that's the rack method. I did go over the cable. Uh, what's modeled here is a 40-pound constant force spring that came down and was attached to the second stage, which isn't shown. Um, what I won't do, unless there's some demand for it, so please let me know if there is demand. Or actually, I will do this. I'll, I'll have another video where I come in, and I'll pull this rack and pinion out and show how I would do this same elevator with 25 chain and a gearbox down here. And I'll actually I'll do that with all off-the-shelf VEX gearing. I won't redo the elevator to be off-the-shelf VEX, but without too much imagination, you could see how someone could make this elevator with mostly Versa chassis and gussets, and then a couple places where you be careful and work by hand and hand drill things. But these bearing gaps here, uh, I know 111 in 2011 had a 16th of clearance, and you know if you're careful by hand, 
you can drill a hole within a sixteenth. So this elevator is certainly something a team could make with entirely Vex parts and uh, a little bit of elbow grease. And come kickoff, if the game just screams elevator, I wouldn't be too surprised, since Vex has that laser in-house, if they decided to cut all the plates like this so you can make your own completely versa chassis elevator. So I'll make a video where I power this with 25 chain instead of the rack. A lot of people ask me, did we love the rack? Um, I think that's really game dependent and it's really motor dependent. If I really wanted to run an elevator off a of mini sim, the rack and pinion would be horrible because you have these big motors up here. Um, and the way the rack and pinion works, if we put a motor down here and link the power up, that's just dumb because that chain or belt that we're using to link power up, we could just directly power the elevator with, which I'll show in that next video. Uh, it did work out to be pretty light. I did get some criticism that it was a really heavy system, but well, I've got the cat in front of me, and we had a timing belt and an elevator rigged method catted for this. Unfortunately, I lost those files, so I'm going to have to redo that. And this was lighter than both of those methods. I'm sure we could have shaved weight out of the other ones a little bit, but this worked out to be pretty darn light. Not a huge weight savings, but I'll at least say that it's comparable. And uh, very strong, except for the weakness on doing nine tooth gears. Uh, I switched those to 4140 steel and they were fine. Um, I think switching those to a bigger diameter, uh, taking advantage of a slower motor here, possibly a bigger gear here. I think the Tetrix gears are 32 DP, so that's a nice source of a 120 tooth gear, whereas this is a 96. And that really gets the big weakness of the rack out, because actually the, the rack is very strong. It's the pinion that's a little weak. And then it'd also be nice to increase this shaft diameter, because that, I believe, is a quarter inch hex which obviously is a little weak point. So we made those steel uh, for that reason. And actually, I think he did something clever when he made this, in that this was actually 5 16 steel round, and he pressed or glued an aluminum hex onto that to get that diameter change, so that he didn't have to machine all of this. He used 5 16 precision ground shaft, just did the hex, pressed that on. He's a smart kid, though. I'm trying to get my company to hire him, actually, so it'd be great if he was working near me. All right, so I think I covered everything here in terms of power transmission. I'm going to come back and do another video on uh, doing this with chain like I talked about. If you guys feel like I missed anything or if you have any more questions. Oh, I guess I did miss one thing. Uh, part of the rack and pinion made it kind of nasty to put an encoder out here that's just super exposed. So we actually ran the encoder just off a separate idler gear. Uh, one thing we overlooked when we designed this is the elevator has slop, so this spacing will change. So we did this gear to that with kind of exact center to center. Uh, we should have moved it like 30 thou over. That does introduce some backlash into the elevator. That wouldn't have been a big deal. Or we could have bit the bullet and made a nice cover and put the encoder out here. Um, we could have printed lines and done a couple of those kit make your own quadrature encoders. Um, I'd like to stay more off the shelf than doing something like that. Uh, you could also do a string pot. Andy Mark's got that cool one now. You know, mount your string pot down here or something and string up to this guy. So a lot of options there. All right, I hope everyone learned something, and let me know if there are any questions. Thanks.